Hi everyone and thank you for joining me for today's LinkedIn Live. We're going to talk about how to pass the Salesforce Certified Administrator exam. So I can see people are trickling in steadily. So let's kick off today's session with a little bit of housekeeping. So first things first, the lines are muted, but you can submit your questions in the comments box and I'm going to try and answer as many of them as possible. And if you can't stay for the whole thing, or if there's some useful information and you want to share this with your colleagues or friends, then the webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find it here on LinkedIn and also on Salesforce Ben's YouTube channel. So why don't we kick off today with a little bit about myself. My name is Christine Marshall. I'm the Salesforce Evangelist and Courses Director at Salesforce Ben. I'm a longtime administrator and accidental admin. I fell into this in 2014 and I'm now a Salesforce MVP. I hold six certifications and I'm also the leader of the Bristol Admin User Group. Now, a big part of my job here at Salesforce, Ben, has been to grow our courses offering, and I'm a huge fan of core functionality, of admin functionality. So I write our free practice exams, our practice exam packs, and have also created a Salesforce Certified Administrator course as well. And it was doing this that made me think a webinar like this might be really beneficial to people who are just starting out studying, for those who are on their journey studying, or even those who have been an admin for some time but haven't quite built up the courage yet to go and take that certification. So I'm really excited to be here with you today for the next hour. So what's on the agenda today? Well, I've broken it down into three parts. So wherever you are, we've got something for you. And first of all, we're going to talk about how you can study effectively. Then we're going to talk about exam day, some exam test taking tips, what you can expect. And then finally, and I'm really excited about this bit, this is the first time uh, that we've done this, we're going to do a breakdown, an in-depth discovery into some practice exam questions. So you and I are going to look at 10 different questions, I'm going to look at the answers, I'm going to talk about how we can read the questions and dissect them and look at the different answers and how do we come up with the correct answers because I think context is everything and I know that it helps me to put things into context so hopefully going through these practice exam questions is going to help reassure you and put all these tips that we're going to talk about into context into practice for you. So I'm also going to keep an eye on the comments. I can see them all coming through. We've got people from all over the world joining us. Welcome everyone. Now we will have a Q&A section at the end, but I would also encourage you if you've got questions during a specific slide or in a specific section, then feel free to post them in the comments box and I will try and address them as we go through. So our first section then is how to study effectively. And I'm going to talk you through from very much getting started if you're brand new to this. And then hopefully we've got some tips if you're already on this journey as well. So the first thing to say is that you should always get started with the official exam guide from Salesforce. And you can find this on Trailhead. Now this is your one-stop shop for the format of the exam, how many questions there will be, how much time will be allowed, what the passing score is, and the topics and their different weightings. And it's a good idea to check in with the official exam guide frequently because Salesforce have been known to change the topics and weightings and to add things to the syllabus that you need to know about. So always go to Trailhead to Salesforce as your number one point of reference for what you need to do to pass the administrator exam. So the next thing is to pay attention to topics and weightings. So you can see here, these are the different topics and their percentage on the administrator exam. And we've got some really heavy hitting sections here. So configuration and setup and object manager and lightning builder, they both account for 20% each. Now that's a lot of the exam. Just a few of the sections here can account for many of the questions. And we're aiming to get 
39 out of the 60 questions right to pass this exam. So focus on those big sections, the ones with the heaviest weightings, especially if you're short on time. If you're challenging yourself to pass the exam in a short amount of time, then perhaps don't focus as much on the smaller weighted sections and instead focus on the heaviest weighted sections. Now, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to sign up for a practice developer org if you haven't already. And don't be put off because a developer org is not just for developers. It's just a free practice environment and everyone, anyone can sign up for one completely free and it's yours to keep. Now, you'll want to link your developer org to Trailhead and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But what I really wanted to point out here was to use your personal email address when you sign up for a developer org. Please don't use anything to do with your work. So don't use a work email address because potentially if you change jobs, you could lose access to this environment. And this is for you. It's your personal developer environment for your hands-on practice. So next, sign up to Trailhead. I'm hoping that the majority of you have already signed up to Trailhead and are well aware of what it is. But just in case you missed it, Trailhead, according to Salesforce, is the fun and free way to learn in-demand skills. And it is, it's got modules and trails covering everything. We've got technical skills, business analysis skills, soft skills, how to do discovery, how to write documentation. There really is something for everyone and something for every role. So Trailhead is going to be key in your learning of Salesforce and passing your Salesforce admin exam. Again, use your developer org credentials and by this I mean use personal email address, personal credentials to sign up to Trailhead. This is for you. It doesn't need to have ties to your work. And if you've not used Trailhead before, you can complete the Trailhead Basics module, which will talk you through the different things that Trailhead ha has to offer. So trails, trail mixes, super badges, the different types of learning experiences that you can get from Trailhead. And then finally, in case you missed it, you can always learn on the go using Trailhead Go. So download it on your mobile from the App Store, from the Google Play Store, and you can access Trailhead as you move around. So I thought, let's just pause here. And what's the difference between a Trailhead Playground and a developer org? Because nobody really talks about this. And they are very, very similar, and you can have both. So they are both free test environments. And the joy of this is that they contain most of the features of Salesforce for free. So even if you don't get to use something as part of your job, you still get access to it in a playground and a developer org. So perhaps you don't have service cloud for your job, but with a developer org, you've got access to those service cloud objects. You can get hands on. And this is one of the best ways to learn. Having theoretical knowledge is great, but having hands on practice is what's really going to cement things and help you as you approach the exam. So why do we have Trailhead Playgrounds at all? Well, Trailhead Playgrounds can contain certain specific data or packages that are needed to complete particular badges or challenges. So they'll come pre-populated with perhaps custom objects, custom fields, and special data that you're going to need as you work through a module. Multiple playgrounds are normal, nothing to be worried about, and always, always create a new playground if it tells you to. So you'll notice as you move through Trailhead that it will sometimes say, you need to spin up a new playground to complete this challenge. Never ignore that, that's really important. If you don't, then this is when you tend to get bugs and errors and you can't complete your challenge. So never ignore that warning. And don't panic if you've got 20 playgrounds, that's absolutely fine. So once you're in Trailhead, let's start getting hands-on. So I wanted to simplify for you what you might want to do as part of your admin certification because Trailhead is amazing, but there are thousands of different badges that you could do. And I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. So the things that I would recommend you look at in Trailhead are the admin beginner and admin intermediate trails. They're going to go through most of the concepts and features that you need for the admin exam. And once you've done those, 
Then next, you'll want to complete the admin certification trail and the admin certification trail mix. Now, these have both been specially curated by Salesforce to contain all of the things that you should know for the exam. So the most important features in an order that Salesforce recommends. So if you haven't, take a look at those. So I thought we could talk a little bit about assessing your learning style because we've talked about Trailhead, we've talked about getting a developer org, you've read the exam guide, but there are external resources and you may need more than Trailhead in order to pass your exam. And what you want to do before thinking about what external resources you're going to use is assessing your learning style what kind of resources are going to be really beneficial to you? Because there are lots of different external training resources and they all have pros and cons. Some of them are very heavy, heavy video based. Some are pure written content. And it really comes down to what suits you best. Personally, I love written content, but a lot of people can find that too dry and they want video content instead. So our different types of learners then, we've got visual learners. So they like to see information to retain it graphs, charts, infographics, screenshots. Our auditory learners learn by hearing. So they're going to enjoy things like this, uh, videos, webinars, recordings, podcasts. Read write learners learn best through words. So blog posts, step-by-step -step tutorials, white papers. And if you are a read write learner, then take notes because that's going to really help you cement what you're learning. And then finally, our kinesthetic learners learn by doing. So for you, spin up a developer org, get your trailhead playgrounds going and play along. So it's a good idea to have some sense of what works best for you before working out what other resources you're going to use to support your journey. Choose your additional resources wisely. So there are as I say, several other external resources, and there are some considerations when choosing them. So no matter what you choose, make sure that they are reputable. You need something that's 100% original. You will need it to be accurate and up to date. It should be aligned with the official exam guide. So make sure it's covering all those topics and they understand what the weightings are and what the objectives are. And it needs to be updated with each release because Salesforce has three releases a year and you need content that's being updated in line with those releases so you don't miss anything. And then again, think about what aligns with your learning style. Should you go for a course that's entirely video based? Should you go for something that's completely written? Or do you need a combination as well? Use practice exams. I love this. Practice exams are my favorite and I use them for all of my exams that I take. I find them so useful. So why use practice exams? Well, they're going to help you get comfortable with the timed exam environment. And I think it's good to remember that most of us haven't taken an exam in quite some time, especially if we're five, 10, 20 years into our career. The last time we took a timed exam could be college or high school. So we need to get used to feeling that time pressure and staying relaxed, staying comfortable, staying calm. Practice exams are going to help you familiarize yourself with the exam format. So with those questions, with the types of questions and answers, how they might trip you up, how they might phrase things, what keywords to look out for that are going to help you identify the right answers. Practice exams can help you assess your readiness. So you can take the practice exams and see how you're scoring. Any good practice exams are going to give you section level scoring and they're going to help you identify areas to focus on. So you can work out one of my weakest areas, where should I focus my studies? But on the flip side of that, practice exams can help you increase your confidence. As you're doing them, you might find that you're scoring really highly in a certain section, which gives you a little boost that you really get those concepts. Or if you keep taking practice exams, as you see those scores improve, it's going to give you that confidence boost that you've really got it and you might be almost ready for the exam. 
That said, not all practice exams are created equally. So be very careful when you choose your practice exams. They should be written by professionals. They need to be tested. They need to be 100% original. We can't have anything that's been taken from a Salesforce official exam. Practice exams need to follow the official exam guide. So they need to cover all seven exam topics and 27 objectives. Now I write the practice exams for Salesforce Ben. And before we even get started writing any questions or any answers, there's a big process involved in working out exactly how many questions are needed per topic and how many questions are needed per objective. Because if I know that you're likely to get 10 questions about flow on an exam, there's no point in me giving you an exam that only has one flow question. So make sure that you are using things that are aligned with the exam guide. They should be timed and formatted to replicate the real exam. Again, get used to that time pressure, get used to the types of questions and the formatting, get used to using mark for review during the exam so you know which questions to come back for and they should come with explanations, screenshots, links to official Salesforce resources so that you know why an answer was correct or why it was incorrect. Those explanations are the most valuable part of practice exams. And again, a reminder that wherever you get your practice exams for, make sure that they say they are updating them with every release. You've got to make sure you've got the most up-to-date material. So on that note, we have a free practice exam for the Salesforce admin. So we've got some QR codes on the screen here. The first one, that's our free practice exam on the Salesforce Ben site. Go and check it out if you haven't already. And then we do also have a pack of five practice exams and seven topic level exams that we sell. And at the end of the webinar, we are gonna give you a 50% discount code off of those. So these are just some extra resources that you can use. So we'll come back to these later on on, there'll be another chance to scan these if you need to. And finally, on practice exams, please, please avoid exam dumps and unverified resources. Exam dumps are cheating. It's plain and simple. It goes against credential security. And if Salesforce find out, then they will take away that certification. And be very careful with some resources, things like Quizlet, which may be out of date. We see a lot of people using flip cards, which aren't up to date and haven't been updated in quite some time. So just make sure that it's a reputable source. I can see in the comments here, people are talking about good, good sources. And yes, Focus on Force is great. Uh, you've got people like Mike Wheeler and Francis Pindar. Talk to other people in the community, Google it. There are some clear reputable sources out there and I would stick with those just to make sure that you are covered for the admin exam. So the next thing you can do whilst you're studying is there are other free resources. Attend a free Salesforce certification date. Now these are great. They are free half-day webinars and they're led by Salesforce instructors. Certification days is run by Salesforce themselves. And at the end of it, if you attend, you get a $40 discount off any $200 exam. So that's even more of an incentive. What I would say about certification days is these are great towards the end of your study. So if you are two to four weeks out before you plan to take your exam, this is when I think will be most beneficial to do a certification day. And the reason for that is they are a super rapid pace. This is like a cramming session for four hours. So they're gonna go over the biggest weighted sections, the key topics, they won't cover everything, but it's best if you already feel very comfortable with the material. So just bear that in mind. And the slots fill up really, really fast. So if you Google Salesforce certification days, they have a site. Keep an eye on there because they do release different time slots, different time zones, and they do get filled up very, very quickly. But I highly recommend certification days. I've done several myself. 
And then I also wanted to mention a couple of other free Salesforce training programs. So we have Salesforce Fundamentals, which is a three week virtual course run by Salesforce. And I specifically wanted to mention it today because the next cohorts kick off really soon. So we've got EMEA on the 4th of August and APAC on the 5th of August. So if you're interested, go Google those and find that. That could be well worth your time and those dates are coming up really quickly. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was the Salesforce Pathfinder program. That's again, another virtual program that lasts for 24 weeks. Put that in Google, or we have an article on it on Salesforce Ben, but they can be also really good additional resources for you. I love that. I can see people saying they've signed up as well. So that's great. So next, think about scheduling your exam. And when I was putting together this slide deck, I know that one of the questions people would love me to answer is how long will it take me to study? And I don't have a good answer for you because it's a case of how long is a piece of string? It's so personal to each individual. It's so personal to, are you already working as an administrator? Are you brand new to Salesforce? Do you have any hands-on practice? Do you have an IT background, an IT degree, no IT background? Do you have children? Are you juggling childcare responsibilities? Are you working full time in another job? There are so many things that impact this question that it is impossible to answer. So it's very subjective, but I do think you want to be realistic about your capacity. And we see a lot of people posting to say, I did. 200 trailhead badges in a week, or I studied for 57 days and passed my Salesforce administrator exam. And whilst that's great and really exciting, one thing I would like to emphasize is that we're all on a very different journey and things will take all of us different amounts of time because we all have different things going on in our lives and not to feel disheartened if you need three months or six months or a year in order to have the time to study and practice and feel confident to take the exam. That's fine too. This is all about becoming a good Salesforce administrator that understands features that can offer a business great value so that they see a return on investment. That's what this is fundamentally about. So if that takes longer, then that's not a bad thing. And I wouldn't want anyone to feel lots of pressure to do things faster than they're comfortable with that they don't have the capacity to do. That said, I do think it's quite useful to set a date. So set yourself a deadline to work towards and that doesn't have to be next week or in two weeks, that could be in two months, in three months, in six months. But I read something recently that said, if you give yourself two weeks to clean your bedroom, it will take you two weeks. If you give yourself two hours to clean your bedroom, it will take you two hours. And I think some of that principle is true. It's very easy to procrastinate. I myself procrastinated and put off an exam for two years. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. Book the exam, give yourself something to work towards. And that date doesn't have to be concrete either. You can change it if you need to, you can push it back, you can bring it forward, but it can just be helpful to get yourself booked in. So just a quick recap then on some useful resources. So first of all, that first QR code here, that's the free Salesforce Ben practice exam, 60 questions, it's timed, it comes with detailed answers and explanations, it's got screenshots, it's got links to Salesforce resources, it's got section level scoring, so super useful to help you assess your readiness. If you do want more practice exams, then the second QR code, that Salesforce Ben's additional practice exam questions, the pack that we sell, and then a QR code here to free certification days. And just a reminder as well that Trailhead also have their own practice exam. So that's the fourth QR code for you. And don't worry, this will all be shared after the recording will be available as well. So moving on to our second section then, how to pass your exam. So this might seem a bit counterintuitive, but if you are 24 to 48 hours before the exam, stop learning new concepts, focus on your weaker areas and you can use your practice exam scoring. It's very tempting to panic and try and learn brand new features, but when you're this close to the exam, it's probably better to focus on 
things that you know, weaker areas that you sort of get instead of learning brand new concepts. Create a cheat sheet. And again, this is great for those read, write learners. A print is one or a written list of notes. So most important information, key concepts, maybe acronyms, things to help you remember the order of certain things, and then just try to memorize them, learn them parrot fashion. If anything, it can just be really reassuring to read through it in the half an hour before the exam. Next, we've talked a lot about them just now, but get in the zone with practice exams. Again, if you're a week, two weeks out at this point, I would be focusing on using practice exams and you can take and retake them. The idea is not to end up parrot learning them so you've just memorized them so you know the answers, but it's to just keep seeing how you can improve, seeing if you're improving on that section level scoring. Your scores might boost your confidence and you can use practice exams to inform your cheat sheet as well. So, when we are in the exam, we need to breathe. It doesn't matter if we're doing it at home or if we're in the test center, breathe, stay calm. It's completely normal to panic. And as we've said, most of us have not been in a test environment for quite some time. That clock starts ticking and it's panic stations. But you need to pay attention to the question and read it at least twice. I'm gonna look at these practice questions shortly and you're gonna see why. There are clues in the question. There will be key words that you need to identify. You want to also use scratch paper if you're on site. If you're doing it remotely, you can't use any paper at all. If you're on site and it helps, you can draw out diagrams to help you figure out the answer. So the same thing goes for the answer. So this is a multiple choice type question. You'll have maybe four or five different options and you need to stay calm. You need to read each answer at least twice and don't skim the answers. This trips me up all the time in practice exams. I'm very confident I know what the answer is and I've skim read the answers until I've got to what I think is the right one and I've missed a word, a key word, or something that's meant that I've by accident, even though I knew, even though I knew the answer, I've still managed to choose the wrong answer on the list. So read those answers at least twice as well. And think best practice, just because it can be done a certain way, doesn't mean it's the best practice way. We want to eliminate any obviously wrong answers. So look for made up features. Some of this does come down to knowing what the standard native features are. But if you think something doesn't sound right, you think I've never heard of that, that doesn't sound like a real feature, there's a strong possibility that it's not. Salesforce make up features as part of these exams. And if it seems obviously wrong, don't panic. It probably is obviously wrong. The exams are designed to test you, but you will come across questions where you feel that that was a bit too easy or those answers were a bit too silly, but that's entirely normal, so don't worry. And again, reiterating, watch out for those non-best practice options. Just because you can do it that way doesn't mean you should. For example, if you saw a question about creating an approval process and your options were to use the standard approval process tool or to use Salesforce Flow, you shouldn't use Flow when there is a standard approval process feature, even though Flow could do it. Use the mark for review. And again, if you haven't used the practice exam yet, um, the practice exams out there, Salesforce Ben practice exams, the Focus on Force practice exams, they include the mark for review option as it's just like the real exam. So what this means is you can easily identify any questions to come back to later and don't dawdle. Don't dawdle in the exam. You have a limited amount of time. So if you don't know the answer, mark for review and move on. Look for clues that can help answer earlier questions. And this is another reason for not dawdling using that mark for review option. As you move through the exam and you'll be able to go back and forth and go back to previous questions and do a review of all the questions later, you might find that there are other 
questions or other answers that give you clues to earlier questions. So keep an eye out for that. Try to go through the entire exam twice. Again, don't dawdle. Answer a question, mark it for review and move on. By doing this, you'll be able to get through the exam twice. You'll be feeling more calm, more confident. You might have found clues later in the exam that will help you answer any that you missed before. And stick with your first answer. I think it's really easy to panic and feel like you need to change your answer. But if you've read the questions carefully, if you've read the answers carefully, if you've been through the exam twice and you're still unsure, then stick with your initial answer. What was your gut feeling? What did you think it was instinctively? Because the chances are you know more than you realize and you probably have it right. So try not to second guess yourself. If you're still completely unsure, then leave it as is and move on. Use all your time. So take your time and use all of the time available. It's very easy, especially if you do it remotely, to be tempted to give it a first pass and then submit the exam, but don't do it. Go through it that second time, go through your mark for review questions and use all your time. And if you follow all of these tips, I guarantee you will use all of the time available to you. And then one thing I wanted to tell you about is what I call the three column trick. Now, the first thing to say about this is you can only really do it if you are on site and you have scratch paper, you can't do this in a virtual exam. But the three column trick is a way of trying to calculate how likely it is that you've passed the exam. So what you do on your scratch paper is you create three columns and you can call them whatever you want, ABC, uh, hot, warm, cold, confident, unsure, no idea, doesn't matter. All that matters is that you know what it means. So in the first column, in the column A, you write the question numbers of the questions you feel confident on. You read that question, you knew the answer, you know, you're confident, you've got this. In the B column, if you felt reasonably confident, but yeah, maybe not quite sure, then put the question in there, question number in there, and then keep C for have absolutely no idea, have never heard of that feature, not a clue. And don't panic if that happens. We all have that in the exams, no matter how well we know the information. I sit there in exam and think, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is at all. So I would put that question in my C column. And what we're trying to do is work out how many questions are in A and B. So if you have 39 questions in the A column, so 39 questions where you're confident that you know the answer, then you've probably passed the exam because that's what we need, 39 out of 60 questions. If you've got 30 questions in the A column and nine in the B column, then again, probably a pass. So it's just an easy way for you to work out what's the likelihood that I've gone through this and I'm going to pass if you need a little reassurance before hitting the submit button. So the next section, very excited, we're going to do a practice question review. I can see that we've got some great comments that have been coming in and we're going to do, we'll have more time for Q&A at the end as well. And I've got people saying, yep, yeah, looping around all of the questions at least twice, super useful. Okay, let's dive into our practice question review because I find that we go on these webinars or we listen to podcasts and everything is very hypothetical and the tips maybe seem a bit obvious or you've forgotten them by the time that you come around to doing the exam. We think I'm already doing that or they seem easy when someone else tells you about them and then when you get into the actual exam, suddenly it's not so easy anymore and you can't remember how to do it. So context is everything, and that's why we're going to look at 10 different practice questions, okay? So very excited to do this. So I know it's lots of words on a slide, but we've got, we've got 25 minutes. We've got time to read these properly. So we're going to have a question, 
it's going to tell you if there's more than one answer. So here you can see that the question says choose two. And then we've got our different answer options. So we're going to read this. Then we're going to talk about what we could look out for in the question and in the answers. And then we're going to reveal the correct answer. So question number one, what is true about converting a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship? And that's choose two. So we need to choose two out of the four answers. Option A, you cannot convert a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship if there are roll up summaries on the master object. Option B, you can convert a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship as long as the lookup field contains a value in all the records. C, you can convert a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship even if the lookup field does not contain a value in all the records. And option D, converting a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship changes the organization by default to controlled by parent and the sharing model is updated to public read write. Very wordy. I've never had to say master detail relationship so often, but this is the type of question that you can expect on a practice exam. So choose two, what do we think are the correct answers to this one? And it does come down to knowing the differences between a lookup relationship and a master detail. So what could we, what should we have looked at? So we should have read through the question twice and you'll notice that this is saying true. What is true about converting? And we're converting a lookup to a master detail. So remember which way we're going. So option A, you cannot convert a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship if there are roll-up summaries on the master object. This trips people up all the time because what people remember about master detail is that only a master detail can have roll-up summaries. If you read answer A carefully, you'll notice that we're talking about converting a lookup relationship. Because it's a lookup, Roll-up summaries cannot have existed here. We're converting from a lookup to a master detail, therefore there will be no roll-up summaries. So A is out. Option B, you can convert a lookup relationship to a master detail relationship as long as the lookup field contains a value in all the records. Now, what do we know about master detail relationships? These are parent-child master detail. And um, what do we know about a parent and child relationship is the child must always have a parent. So option B is one of the correct answers because the lookup field must contain a value. It must be looking up to its new parent record before you can convert it into a master detail. Option C, you can convert a lookup relationship to a master detail even if the lookup field does not contain a value in all records. Well, this is the opposite of B, so it cannot. If B is correct, then C must be false. So if we know that option A is out and option C is out and B is correct, then by default, D must be our second answer. So sometimes where we've got to choose two or three answers, we can get the final answer just by working out which ones are wrong because by default whatever's left must therefore be true. And there we go, B and D are the correct answers here. So let's look at practice question number two. Cloudy Computing has a custom pick list field for team on the opportunity object. They would like the same pick list field and pick list values to appear on account, contact, and various custom objects as well. So what feature of Salesforce could support this? And we've got option A, custom pick list value set, B, a global pick list value set, C, a master pick list value set, or D, a universal pick list value set. Now this is a great example of made up features that don't really exist, that use words that sound really familiar. Words like universal sound accurate. Words like master we come across very often, but the correct answer here is a global pick list value set. So just be careful about words that look right, that feel familiar, but actually have nothing to do with what we're being asked. So question number three, 
Cloudy Computing has two distinct teams for selling products and services. Each team follows a different set of steps and collects different information during the sale. What features in Salesforce will best support this situation? A, create a page layout and a record type for each team. B, create a sales process for each team. C, create a sales process and a page layout for each team. Or D, create a sales process, page layout and record type for each team. So what do we need to think about in this question? So we know that we have two distinct teams and each team follows a different set of steps. When we talk about steps, we are talking about stages. So when you come into the exam and you see the way that Salesforce is describing something, in this instance, set of steps becomes stages. And then we're also talking about collecting different information. Well, that translates as different fields on the page layout. So how do we get to the correct answer? Well, first of all, follows a different set of steps. Different set of steps means a different sales process. And what do you need if you have different sales processes? Well, you need record types. And what do you need if people are using different fields? Well, that's page layouts. So the answer becomes D. They need a sales process, a page layout, and a record type. And watch out. So in this answer, I have put sales process, then page layout, and then record type, because I don't want to help you remember that sales processes and record types go hand in hand. So I've separated them with page layout in the middle here, just to throw you off the scent even more. Question four. Cloudy computing would like to be able to generate quotes from Salesforce. Quotes should contain account name, amount, and any discount. Quotes should be able to be emailed to customers from Salesforce. As the Salesforce administrator, what would you suggest? Option A, create a custom object called quotes. B, choose a tool from the App Exchange. C, use the standard object quotes. And D, use an Apex trigger to automatically generate a quote from an opportunity. One thing to note here when you go into the exam is you might find some of the questions quite wordy. They're giving you a lot of information and they will give you information that's not particularly relevant. It just adds fluff and adds a bit of confusion. And your job is to look out for the keywords of what you need. So part of this here does come down to knowing Salesforce native objects. So quotes should contain account name, amount and discount and should be able to be emailed from Salesforce, where there is a standard object called quotes that can achieve all of this functionality. So know your objects and don't let all the extra description, all the fluff distract you from what the question is asking. Okay, next, number five. Why should you consider using the data import wizard over the data loader? A, you need to import more than a million records, B, you require some deduplication. C, you need to import custom objects only. D, you need field auto mapping functionality. If you are studying for the admin exam, no difference between the data import wizard over the data loader, okay? It can be key for the exam. So what can we look at here? Well, we're looking about when should we use the data import wizard? So what does the data import wizard do? that the data loader doesn't do, or what is unique about the data import wizard? So in A, you need to import over a million records. Well, the data import wizard can't do that. It can only do up to 50,000, so A is out. B, you require some deduplication. Now, this is a feature that's often missed. People forget about it. The data import wizard does offer you some deduplication. You can do things like match uh, lead email addresses when you do an import or an upsert to avoid adding duplicates. C, you need to import custom objects only. And D, you need field auto mapping. Well, these are not unique to the data import wizard. So they're not a reason to use the import wizard over data loader because both of these tools can do it. So the correct answer here is you require some deduplication. Data import wizard cannot do A and C and D are not unique to the data import wizard. So deduplication is the answer here. 
And one thing I wanted to show you is look for study resources that do things like this. This is one that I had made for my Salesforce Ben admin course. Just a really simple graphic that shows you a yes or no comparison between different tools. This sort of thing can be really helpful to get your head around stuff. Okay, practice question number six. Alistair and Andy are both on the recruitment team at Cloudy Computing. They should both be able to review and edit applications. However, only Andy, as the manager, should be able to delete applications. Both users are currently assigned the recruitment team profile. How can this requirement be achieved in Salesforce? A, create a new custom profile for Andy. B, create a new permission set and assign to Alistair. C, create a new permission set and assign to Andy. And D, set up roles and ensure that Andy is in a role higher than Alistair. What are we looking out for in this question? What are we actually being asked to do here? What we're being asked is to give Andy an additional permission to delete applications. So the first option here is creating a new custom profile just for Andy. Now, best practice dictates that we should maintain as few profiles as possible. We should have more generic profiles like sales team or recruitment team, and then we should use permission sets to assign permissions to individual users or small groups of users. So that makes B and C look very promising because we're talking about permission sets. And this is one of the places where I wanted to highlight to you, never skim the answers. So if you were quickly reading through this question and you got to B and you saw create a new permission set, you might think, yep, tick, got it, done, I know that. But if you continue to read the answer, you'll notice that it says, and assign to Alistair. So this is the wrong option because Alistair should not be the one getting the delete permission. The correct answer is C, because yes, we want a permission set, but it has to be assigned to Andy. Andy is the manager. Andy is the one that should get the delete permission. And D, just a note here, so set up roles and ensure that Andy is in a role higher than Alistair. Well, profiles, control what someone can do, roles control what someone can see. So we could use roles and the role hierarchy to give Andy visibility of records that are owned by his subordinates, but roles do not control what someone can do on an object. It doesn't control if you can delete something. So just as a recap there, C is the answer. Permission set and assign it to Andy. Okay, number seven, as a Salesforce administrator, what do you need to set up to define what happens when duplicate rules are detected? A, matching rules, B, duplicate rules, C, deduplication rules, or D, data.com rules. This comes down to, again, read the question, what is it asking for, and read those answers very, very carefully. So we are being asked to define what happens when duplicate records are detected. What happens? Now, if you know Salesforce, then you're probably sat here knowing that matching rules are a thing. Duplicate rules are also a thing. Deduplication rules are not a thing, not a real feature, and it's not data.com rules either. Matching rules and duplicate rules go hand in hand, but they do slightly different things. They work together, but slightly differently. So a matching rule defines whether or not something matches. What fields are we looking at? Are we matching on first name, last name, email address? How are we going to identify that it's a duplicate? But it's duplicate rules that then decide what happens. So if I'm creating a lead and it's a duplicate, should I get an error message but still be able to save? Or should I be blocked from saving at all? If there's a duplicate, should I not be allowed to create my lead? So it's duplicate rules here. Question number eight. Sometimes cloudy computing support agents need to work with multiple contacts from an account to resolve a case. What feature of Salesforce can support this? A, account team, B, case team, C, contact roles, or D, contacts to multiple accounts. 
So a couple of things to think about in this question here. Salesforce will throw in extra descriptive words, maybe objects that really have very little to do with what they're asking you to achieve. So what are we being asked for here? So we're talking about working with multiple contacts to resolve a case. But notice how we've got this chunk in the middle that starts talking about account. It's not actually relevant to what we're being asked to do. So don't let extra fluff distract you from the correct answer. So multiple contacts at an account resolving a case. So we've got account team. All of these options are real things. Account teams, case teams, contact roles, contacts to multiple accounts. These are all real features, but which is the one that we want? So an account team, well, again, we're not working. We we're talking about cases. We're not talking about accounts in particular. It's not the account team. That is a way to share uh, record access with other users, Salesforce users working on an account. It's not a case team. That would be a very tempting option because we know that we're looking at a case. But a case team is a way of granting record access or identifying team mem members that are working on a case internally. So Salesforce users, support agents that are currently working on a case together. Contact roles is how we identify a contact's role within an account or within a case. And then contacts to multiple accounts, it's a real feature, but it lets a contact be linked to more than one account. So not really anything to do with our question here. So the correct answer is contact roles. What this allows you to do is you add it as a component on your case and you can say which contacts is the uh, someone from HR or is the decision maker, the executive, who is the primary contact for this particular case. And you might use this if you take over a case from a colleague. So maybe your colleague's gone on holiday and you've taken over a case and you need to know which of the multiple contacts you should talk to, then you would refer to contact roles. So question nine. And I thought, you know, I knew you'd enjoy the first question about page layouts and sales processes. So let's do it again and let's make it more complicated. This time we're going to choose two answers. So Cloudy Computing now has three sales teams. The bid team looks after large bids that require additional stages and gathering additional data. The telemarketing team and general sales team follow the same stages and gather the same data. What do you need to achieve this requirement? And again, we've got to choose two. So one sales process, page layout and record type for the bid team, one sales process, page layout and record type for the general sales team, one sales process, page layout and record type for the telemarketing team, one sales process, page layout and record type for the general sales team and telemarketing team to share, or finally, one sales process, page layout and record type for the bid team, general sales team and telemarketing team to share. Lots of words, lots of options, lots of words repeated, again, to throw you off. So what do you think is the right option here? And what can we do to analyze this question? So we have three sales team. That's the first thing to know. And what have we been told about these teams? Well, the bid team has additional stages. So what do we know about stages, different stages? different sales process. We're also being told that they gather additional data, which could be translated into they need different fields on the page layout. So straight away, we know that the bid team needs additional stages, which means they need a record type and they need additional data. So they need another page layout. We've been told the telemarketing team and the general sales team follow the same stages as each other and gather the same data. So option A is one of the correct answers because we've identified that the bid team requires something different to the other two teams. Now, because option A is correct, option B and C must be incorrect because we know general sales and telemarketing share the same information. So they don't need their own sales process each or page layout. Option D, we are creating a sales process, page layout, and record type for the general sales team and telemarketing team to share. Well, if A is correct, 
then D is also correct because it means we've given the bid team what they need and now we just need to give the general sales team and telemarketing team their page layout and process and record type and therefore E is incorrect. E means sharing the same sales process and page layout for all three teams, which is the opposite of what the question has told us. So just to recap, it's A and it's D. Again, be very careful, D and E look so similar that if you're skim reading the answers, it could be very easy to get tripped up. And then number 10, Andy's profile has read and edit access to the job object. The organization-wide default for job is public read only. What access will Andy have to job records? And this is a choose two. So option A, Andy will be able to view and edit all job records not owned by himself. Option B, Andy will be able to view but not edit all job records not owned by himself. C, Andy will be able to view and edit job records owned by himself. And D, Andy will not be able to view or edit job records not owned by himself. Again, a quick skim of those. They all look very, very similar, but they have striking differences. So we've been told that Andy's profile has read and edit access to the job object. Profiles control what we can do on records. We also know that the organization wide default for job is public read only. And one of the things I want you to think about is the most restrictive thing wins. So Andy's profile might have read and edit access, but where the organization wide default is public read only, he will not have access to records he doesn't own. So Andy's profile defines what he can do and what he can do to his own records, but the organization-wide default controls what he can see, what records he can see, and what he can do to those records that he does not own. So the correct answers are B and C. Andy will be able to view, but not edit, all job records not owned by himself. So what we're saying here is if Andy doesn't own the job record, he can see it because the org wide default is public read only, but he cannot edit it. The org wide default setting of read only trumps his edit ability in his profile. And C, Andy will be able to view and edit job records owned by himself. If he owns it, then his profile says he can read and edit. So just be very careful, read the question twice, read the answers twice, lots of the answers are going to look very, very similar. So that was our practice 10 questions. Let's skip on to some resources and we'll take a quick look at some questions. So if you are studying, if you're looking for extra resources, we do have our courses site. So we have a certified admin course that's got written style blogs, step-by-step -step tutorials and instru instructor-led video, uh, also mini quizzes. We've got our pack of practice exams that got five full exams and seven topic level exams. And we also do a bundle. And for everyone on the call today, we have done a discount code. So if you put admin live 50 in at the checkout, that will give you a 50% discount off any of these admin courses. But I also want to reiterate that we also have a lot of free content on the blog. So don't forget to check out our free practice exam. And we also have our free admin study guide as well. And if you just want to learn a little bit more about certain features, you can use the search bar on the Salesforce Ben site. You know, if you want to learn about the data import wizard or data loader, use the search bar because we've got lots of other free resources on there for you. So Let's have a quick look at some of these questions. I hope you found the practice questions useful. Hopefully it made sense. Hopefully it tested your knowledge. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat now while I just look at some of the latest comments and see if we've got any questions here. Really great to see people saying that they did enjoy the practice questions. You know, some of these questions, they make your brain hurt. They really make your brain hurt and you think you've read it right. You're so sure you, uh, and you trip up. I do it all the time. 
Okay, I'm scrolling up, loving everyone taking part in the practice exam questions. And again, don't forget, this has been recorded. So if you felt like you um, didn't know the answer or you want to recap, you can watch it afterwards. Someone's saying they've never used the import wizard. I recommend that you do. Um, it's, as I say, it's got functionality like deduplication that people always forget about that Data Loader doesn't have, although I personally do prefer Data Loader. Don't tell Salesforce. Okay, let's have a quick look. Any questions? Don't forget, if you want to, then pop any extra questions in. And I'll just see if there's anything that we didn't get to. Oh, someone felt the questions were easy. I'm glad you will see you'll ace your exam. <laughs> uh, glad you liked the three column trick as well. I really like it. And I wish you could use it if you were doing a session remotely. And yes, lots of people commented to say some answers contradict each other, which is a great thing to look out for. If they contradict, you know, at least one of them is wrong. What else have we got here? Yes, go through the exam twice. Let's see, new comments. Let's see if we've got any new questions in here for our last minute. Ooh, someone asking about, is it, okay, no, this is a really great point. Is it true that non-English speakers can get some more time in the exam? Yes, it is true. Uh, not just non-English speakers, if you have any kind of uh, illness or disability, that means you might need some extra considerations, uh, bathroom breaks, uh, drinking water, food breaks, then yes, you need to contact um, Salesforce and they can advise you and they can tag on extra time. And I think it's something like 10, 20 minutes that you get. So yes, if you need that, definitely, definitely ask for it. Uh, someone else was asking about IP ranges on the org wide default and profiles. Uh, I don't see your name and we are running out of time. So um, if you want to ask me about that, send me a message on LinkedIn. Happy to talk about it further afterwards if you've got a specific question. Oh, Craig, what is the best way to get out of a rut if you are taking exams on specific content and getting in the 40s and 50s in your opinion? Uh, very, very difficult and you don't want to stagnate and you don't want to do the same practice exam over and over again, especially if you're not improving. I think for me, when I do practice exams, when I'm scoring around 85, 90% is when I personally feel most comfortable to go and take an exam. I think if you are sort of hitting the 40s and 50s, it does sound like um, you're not ready on those particular sections yet. I would perhaps stop using practice exams and I would go back and study those topics. So let's say it was um, process automation or reports and dashboards, step away from the practice exams, redo trailhead, redo any resources that you've got, you know, perhaps you've got focus on four study guide, or perhaps you use my admin course, go back through all of that, take some time away from those exams, and then go back and try again, or maybe try different practice exams as well, so that you don't get stuck in a rut of just parrot learning and memorizing the same information. Uh, someone said, asked about the questions, are there 60 or 65? There are 60 questions. However, Salesforce may add an additional five unscored questions. So you may end up doing more in the exam, but it's 60 that you're being scored on and that don't count. And someone else said, can we please share the recording? Uh, this is being recorded and it will be available here on LinkedIn afterwards and also on the Salesforce Ben YouTube channel. I know I've gone over time. Thank you so much if you've stayed with me for this entire uh, LinkedIn live session. I really hope you found it beneficial. It's absolutely my passion to try and help people get Salesforce admin certified to demystify it and make it seem a little bit less scary. So hopefully that's been achieved today. If we didn't get to see your question, and I'm really sorry if I didn't, so many comments and questions coming in, so I may have missed it. I will try and go back through all the comments after this session and answer. And of course, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message if you've got any specific questions and the recording will be available. So 
go back through this if there's anything that you want to recap on. But again, just a huge, huge thank you to everyone for joining today. And I hope you really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining me.